So, um, hello and welcome everyone to this uh, panel discussion on addressing wicked problems in learning through games and gamification. Um, I'm Sarah Leferve. Rob did a very good job of introducing me, so I'll move straight on to Monica Cornetti, our first panellist. Uh, Monica works with individuals and organisations who want to learn how to think differently to achieve results. She's the founder and president of Sententia Gamification, which is based in Austin, Texas. Monica also hosts the Gamification Quest podcast and is the Game Master of Gamicon, the international conference for the gamification of learning. Monica is hired for her skill as a gamification speaker and strategist at the top of her field in gamification design for corporate training and adult education. When she's not busy uh, gamification, Monica found researching gamification. Ben, creative educator, designer, and research. As a result, he studies games design and teaches others how to use games for education. School of Professional Studies. Past experience points and consults at University XP on games based learning. His interests include professional development, learning theory, technology, and games. And you can find out more about Dave at daveangdesign.com. Antonis Triantafila combines experiential learning with gamification to make learning engaging and effective. With over a decade of experience in international youth work, he's now based in Berlin and multiplies his impact on youth, which is his favourite target group, by training trainers and tech startups to bring a positive change in the world through the power of learning. Welcome, panellists. So, um, to give a Pleasure bit of an introduction here. about what this panel is hoping for. Hello? <laughs> Everybody okay? Right, this panel wishes yes. to explore the use of games and gamification to address wicked problems. Games are often seen as effective in experiences to increase knowledge, explore complexity, or critique beliefs and values. For example, in problems such as inequality, dysfunctional cultures, the climate crisis, and so on. So games such as the SDG 2030 card game, which is a project-based exploration of uh, organisational sustainability, Urgent Evoke, which sends to solve real-world problems, or Fold It, uh, which asks players to solve puzzles, which are actually real-world biotech protein folding problems. They're all good examples of these. Today, however, we want to focus on wicked problems within learning itself. Uh, as learning we constantly face issues around accessibility, content and quality. So we're going to address a few of these here. So Dave, um, I'd like to put this first question to you. Uh, one of the greatest concerns to emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic for many learning providers is managing the transition from classroom-based delivery to an online model. So how might games or gamification play there was content, as frameworks for taking advantage of the additional functionality of online or as part of our own design or transposition processes. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And uh, good morning to the, the rest of the American contingent of this panel, uh, Antonius and, and, and uh, Monica. Um, so I think I want to jump right into this question because I think this is a really valuable one and one that is particularly evident right now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, specifically in my institution at New York University and a lot of other institutions in the United States and the world, we've had to move a lot of our pedagogical and educational practices online. Now that isn't to say that a lot of what we were doing before wasn't already being done online or being taught remotely. My class is I teach all remotely. However, what I've been trying to emphasize with a lot of different faculty members I work with and with a lot of different educators, trainers, and, and people that work in learning and development is that in a traditional model, and I like to use the phrase, we teach the way we are taught, is that it tends to be very serial and also very linear. And what I think really gives games a lot of great focus and attention is the fact that there is agency for players. There is a structure for decision making and there's also a structure for interaction. So one of the things I've also told a lot of different faculty members at NYU is that if you're going to take your course content and provide it online, whether that be in a synchronous environment over Zoom or something like an asynchronous environment where you're just in a learning management system is 
Previously, you had to have your learners go from step A to step B to step C to step D without any choice or any different direction. But the philosophy I'm promoting right now is that why do students have to go in that direction? Can students make a choice here? And if they do make a choice, how can they make choices that better align what your learning outcomes are with what are the best pedagogical practices using games, gamification, and games-based learning? So that's my insight, but I'd also like to turn it over to our uh, fellow panelists for their insight as well. Cool. I'm sorry, Sarah. Did you ask us? Sorry. Yeah, I just wondered if you had anything to add today's response. When I think about uh, giving teachers, like when we're studying the pedagogy of learning, I think that when we bring games in, uh, we have to re-examine how we've been scoring students uh, in this remote environment. It's not just about knowledge. It's about connections and relationships and engagement and solving problems. And we're not that those are those non-cognitive skills that we're not really measuring in school. So as we look at uh, establishing this pedagogy, how do we measure those? How do we bring those in? How do we educate people that these non-cognitive skills are greater indicators of success than knowledge, the cognitive ones? So it's, are, how are you guys doing that, Dave? Are you focusing on? When, um, when I've been working with faculty members, sometimes we first try to determine whether or not they're going to be teaching synchronously over Zoom or asynchronously using a learning management system. But we also ask them, like, how have you scheduled your classes before? And what they've done is, you know, they do the week system, which is like this week we cover this, this week we cover that. Then you do an assignment or something else. And I ask them, it's like, are, are there any opportunities for students here to choose what they want to focus on or do anything else? For for us, at least in the school professional studies, makes a lot of sense because we have a lot of adult learners. However, right. it's kind of hard to to do that sometimes, you know, like high school or undergraduates or you know primary school students. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with what you both mentioned, and uh, it's worth to mention that the PISA results uh, that in the past two iterations. The, uh, for those who don't know, the PISA are a uh, measurement from the OECD where they're testing 15-year-old, uh, if I'm not mistaken, students from all over the planet, uh, at least the OECD member countries, uh, in, their, um, in, their, in their skills and how they score in the basic topics. And in the past, few, the past two iterations, they're also measuring soft skills. And the, the result is that the countries that do implement a lot more interactive learning and participatory learning methods they really score the students really score higher where you wouldn't expect them to uh, yeah. so that's one thing and another point is from my experience in youth work what we learn when we are training trainers is actually that 70 uh, percent of your course should be the students doing something instead of you talking yeah. so it works yeah. i know we need to move on but i love David, you're re-examining this because um, and potentially there's a lot, a lot more potential on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you think about um, helping teachers to understand, like what Antonis was just saying, that how would they know without somebody um, helping them to understand that? So really, really good. Super. Um, so I'd like to move to the next question now, and I'd like to address this to you, Monica, if that's okay. Um, the National Foundation for Educational Research, uh, which is in the UK, has published research recently which shows that pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds are less likely to be engaged with remote learning. So in the lockdown scenario, which many countries are in at the moment, this has become a serious inequality issue. So if games and gamification could be used to address the engagement problem, how could we factor in, for example, unequal access to technology? Yeah, and, and so uh, when we think about access to technology, I mean, it goes without saying that our governments need to invest in remote education, providing devices, internet access, resources for children who need them the most. 
And we also know that access doesn't solve the equity problem. It's relationships. Kids want to be a part of something. One of the things that we know is that relationships matter greatly. Companies of all shapes and sizes now are hiring remote engagement managers, and our schools need the same thing. We need coaches who can uh, work with the teachers and the parents and the students to harness the power of technology and games to build a future where all learners have the tools and confidence to achieve their goals. And it doesn't have to be complex. I watched this delightful video this weekend of a teacher putting stickers on her face every time a new student participated. The students were determined to get as many stickers on her face as possible. Needless to say, she looked crazy by the end of it. But it's simple, it's brilliant, it's playful. And not only is it a great way to incentivize and participate, but it's also really low risk. The goal isn't about getting it right. The goal was to get students to participate and to try. And if they felt silly because they got the answer wrong, it's okay because the teacher looks sillier, right? So the teacher who's willing to put herself out there and try, and that's not complex. And that teacher got the idea from watching another teacher on a TikTok video. And that's great. And how can schools be more strategic about, about helping teachers in this way? A coach who can help teachers and parents understand how games create a sense of flow and engagement, help teachers make better choices about the instructional use of games, help teachers to create experiences with high levels of both concentration and enjoyment. I mean, for examples, let's talk about choice uh, that Dave was just talking about. Boys typically read at a grade below their level in school. But you take those same boys and you give them reading as part of an online game, and they actually excel at it because they're given the choice. They want to figure out how to play the game, so they're learning how to read on the game where, because they had the choice to do it. Games help kids to develop non-cognitive skills, like we talked about before, patience, discipline, tenacity. And we know that in the framework of a classroom, these are not getting measured. And we have to learn how to measure it. One of the highest indicators of uh, performance was the act of walking away. And this one research I was uh, studying for one of uh, my clients, it was saying that the best negative indicator of performance was the act of walking away from failure. Low scores themselves were far less significant than abandonment. But how do we measure abandonment in a classroom? I'm as negative as the next person about um, measuring attendance, you know, getting perfect attendance scores. But that's an, an unexpected ne negative outcome of what they were trying to achieve because not being there is directly correlated to not graduating. Students have to be there and be engaged in order to graduate. So by putting in scores that, um, that ways that we can help them to show up, the emotional energy that's created when students play games and they strive to take advantage of the level of excitement and commitment, it's difficult to achieve that through regular classroom instructional strategies. But I think perhaps the most important thing that we can do with technology right now in games is bring students together during this time of them being physically separated. I'm starting to get emotional. This is an extraordinary complex time. And I live in a county in America that is among the very poorest. We're like in the 97th percentile of poverty. And I see it every day. And technology and games can bring connection and community and discovery and expression. And weaving games into these lesson plans can improve engagement, inspire creativity. I don't know, hopefully like blaze a new trail for how our students can learn in the future. Sorry. <laughs> I told you Sarah, when we talked the other day that I'm really passionate about this topic. So. Um, yeah, 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 I do. I, yeah, I feel you, Monica, I feel you. Uh, while you were talking, uh, you reminded me of uh, two of my favorite examples of uh, using games in schools or being inspired by games. 
Uh, one is by John Hunter, the World Peace Game. Uh, I'm not going to analyze either of the two. I just mentioned them so you can Google them and find out about them. And the second one is uh, Sugata Mitra, the Hole in the Wall project in India. So these two are incredible examples of how uh, children are the best at teaching themselves when you create the right structures for them to do so. Right. It doesn't have to be a passive thing of uh, right. you just talking down. Yeah. I just want to add that um, I appreciate Monica's Sorry, dedication to the philosophy of education. Yeah. And um, I was thinking about it and I was like, yes, I think one of the, the basic things that needs to be done is uh, we, we need to have uh, as equitable access to technology as possible. And that's often something that I deal with regularly with my students because, you know, we all assume that we can get a high speed, reliable, broadband internet connection, but we can't assume that for every single one of our learners. Um, so I think addressing that is part of the, um, uh, a part of addressing the challenge. And that's not something that just us as learning and development professionals and those that work in the game industry can do alone. We have to work with partners and stakeholders in order to do that. But I do appreciate Monica's uh, uh, anecdote about the teacher that would just put stickers on her face. Because what I tell um, instructors sometimes is like, there are great technologies available, but let's, let's try to maximize the technology we, we use right now. And uh, on that note, uh, some of my colleagues that work at USC, they've come up with this Zoom game called um, Hello Kitty, You're a Star. I don't know if any of you have played this before, but because of the pandemic, because a lot of people are teaching, working and learning online, often our pets will come into frame at the most inopportune moments. So the way you play Hello Kitty, You're a Star is if, you're, if your pet comes into frame, you must pick up that pet, hold it up to the camera, and then talk as if you were that pet for the next 30 seconds. So I think just introducing moments of levity in the educational conversation is great. It doesn't always have to be about teaching and learning all the time. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and just appreciate the levity of having your dog walk in the frame. That's great. Yeah, I think it's the, um, it's like children learn through play until we put them in the school environment, then we take play away and we minimize it. Uh, we, you know, here, we'll give you 20 minutes of play a day and you better enjoy every minute of it. Uh, it's, it's how all learning happens in children. And then we get them into a school setting and we just strip it away from them. And we can get it can be playful and still be serious. It can be playful and still be challenging. Yeah. It doesn't have to be even stickers on the face, right? If people think, well, that's too silly. Well, <laughs> it depends on the age of your student. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, I'd like to put this final question to Antonis. Um, so the online space is undoubtedly really innovative in terms of platforms and tools, but it feels like the field of online learning is still so new that when you compare it with the hundreds of years of philosophy and psychology and so on that support offline learning theory, that we don't yet have reliable pedagogies with robust theoretical and experimental underpinnings. So how might we use games and gamification to help explore online learning standing in this area? All right, so I promise that I will go meta and I'll go all the way. Uh, so the point that I, I want to make uh, today is that this global pandemic, this crisis has revealed systemic issues, structural issues that were there long before the pandemic even began to take shape. Uh, as an example, if people suddenly only consume the absolute necessities, the economy should not shut down. Uh, I come from Greece and the word economy is actually Greek and it means taking care of your house in the sense of distributing the resources wisely. That's not the way we've been doing this for quite some time now. Uh, the other thing that it showed is that food, housing, health, above all health, but also communication and entertainment, these are essential needs and they need to require essential jobs. This crisis has revealed what actually is and what is not essential. Many jobs that are not really essential, uh, many jobs are not essential, and many of those that are can be done remotely, can be done away from this nine to five work structure where you have to go to an office and all that. Did we really need the crisis? Did we really need the pandemic to realize what is essential? I certainly hope not. And. Um, did we also need a crisis to realize that uh, 
our environment is in peril, like our natural environment. Did you, did you know that uh, in just the past few months, uh, that is less than a year that we've been having long Lost him. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, he dear. went so meta, he blew up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so I go to crisis mode now. <laughs> Do either of you two have any, uh, any thoughts on this question? Hopefully, Antonis will come back before the end, but... Uh... Uh, I will say that... Um... You know, like while we use the while we like to use the terms like gamification and game space learning and uh, learning games, I think one of the the core facets of using these different media for teaching and learning is the fact that it is experiential. And this goes back to what I said before about having to follow like a very linear educational path. Um, I am of the philosophy that lear learning, when, when someone asked me to define learning, I say learning is the transformation of experience into knowledge. And what games do for learning is that it allows the users, allows the students, allows the players to be able to experiment, to be able to play. And sometimes our most valuable lessons we learn come from us not just learning something via rote memory, but being able to experiment, being able to have the freedom to make mistakes and, be, and being able to see the consequences of our actions. So that's the way I would summarize it in general. Yeah. And um, not not afraid of taking that risk and failure because failure isn't failure if I get to try it again. Um, you know, you, you look at how the structure of how we grade and we don't let students retake a test that they failed, but they fail enough and they'll have to retake the whole school year. So where is the logic in that? And I mean, I, I understand, the, again, the desire of uh, here in the United States of our of no child left behind, but look at what it's created. It's just created. <laughs> it's just we're just prepping for the test. And when you attach money to it, you, if that's how the school is getting its funding, it's a no win. And the students are the ones who lose and the parents yeah. and students and teachers and parents start to become enemies of each other instead Absolutely. of collaborating and working together for the for the welfare of the child. And it's they're just fighting so hard that they end up fighting each other. And it, it actually destroys what it was trying to create. And it, Hey, welcome back, Antonis. Your mic's off. Welcome back, Antonis. <laughs> and now it is on again. Meta now, yeah. if you okay, would. so <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I come from outside of the meta to go into this. <laughs> yeah, technical difficulties. Anyway, uh, so as I was saying, uh, as an example of the reduced activity that we had and the impact that it had on the environment. Uh, China has seen a 25% decrease in carbon emissions just in the past few months. This is insane. It shouldn't require a crisis to realize that we are part of this environment and that reduced uh, consumption and reduced traveling has its effect. We should have known before and we shouldn't be pushed to do more of that. So anyway, let's bring it to the topic of learning because this is the topic of this day. Uh, this, all these things that we were told are normal and we've been doing for several decades are a result of the first industrial uh, revolution and public education was shaped in order to fulfill the needs of the first industrial revolution. Uh, there's another TED talk since I keep mentioning TED talks of, uh, and it's my favorite still of the now late Sir Ken Robinson about how schools kill creativity. And uh, I highly recommend a watch of that as well. And it just so happens to be that the, uh, the, the World Economic Forum also posed creativity as a top skill to, to develop if you want to, um, to be relevant to the 21st century and if you want to get a job that, or another job or to continue adapting to the needs of um, the future or the immediate present. So there is, a, there is a lot to show that soft skills are more relevant than hard skills, perhaps the, the exception of uh, learning how to code. But how exactly can we disrupt learning and education when it has been going on for apparently 150 years like that? So this is where gamification comes to play, but there's a catch. So one way to look at it is that you can emulate life as if it was a game. You're born into a game environment. You're born into a socio-political and natural environment. 
you slowly learn the rules of the game, you react to those, you play the game, and you replay again and again. But um, unless there is a purpose, the purpose of the game is to learn something outside of it by playing. And luckily now we do have more and more examples like that. But unless that is the explicit purpose, then we don't really understand the principles behind the game. So life is kind of shaped like that. And more often than not, the aim of the game is to keep playing the game in the current uh, environment that we've been living in. It's almost as if we've been told to play Monopoly while we should have been playing the landlord's game. Google that. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so here's the catch. What I propose in order to disrupt learning and education is uh, that if we want to develop the skills to adapt to the future that we don't know what's going to be like, and if we don't want another pandemic to basically kick us out <laughs> and wake us up, then we should learn to think in systems. And an amazing tool to learn to think in systems is not just to play games, but go a step further and start designing games or applying gamification into small yeah. everyday things, gamify your life. Because this is how you understand what the game is all about and not just play. And I'm going to finish with a quote that is uh, frequently attributed to Confucius, but you know how uh, memes and the images and the quotes <laughs> go. Anyway, you need to fact check that. But the quote itself is very, very useful for uh, my position towards disrupting learning and education. So the quote goes like this. Tell me and I will forget. Show me and I will remember. Involve me and I will understand. And I want all of us to understand the games we're playing. Anton is over. I was just going to add something there. I, I, um, powers behind games is that games um, when you when you view them as entertainment, so if you think of them in terms of games, um, they're, they're mediums for worlds. They allow you to create worlds which don't yet exist, and that's a great space to explore um, any topic really, and, and and to move toward want worlds that you want, and move away from worlds that you don't want. Sarah, over. exactly. <laughs> So I think okay, that is well, thank you, everybody, um, for the insightful response. Do you have any closing comments before I close the panel, anybody? 20 seconds. <laughs> Create <laughs> games apart from playing games, but do play games. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, I think, like, let's take, I want to take it yeah. a step higher, too, Antonis, yeah. is uh, be playful. Uh, think about uh, this is, it doesn't have to look like this. How can we learn math without just doing worksheets? How can we, right? How can we be more playful in our learning? Um, that's what I would be encouraging everyone. I want to say that experience is the name we give our mistakes. Yes. Oh, good. Dave. <laughs> a quote from Dr. Dave Eng. <laughs> we'll make it into a movie. <laughs> Well, thank Rob, you very much, <laughs> um, Antonis Triantafilakis, Etty and Dave, eh? um, This discussion has raised as many questions as it's answered for that. Sorry. So, so I will chat and um, I'm going to room shortly after this. We'll endeavour to that come up your attention um, and I'm, get, I'm sure the panel think that you all enjoy the rest of gamification Europe <laughs>